The Yellow Turban Rebellion. The White Lotus Rebellion. The Red Turban Rebellion. The Nien Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion. These six historical Chinese rebellions, separated across 2,000 years of history, all had one common feature. They all wore coloured turbans. Today, we are going to explore why so many insurrections adopted the turban, and how the turban and its colour underpinned the ideology and the legitimacy of so many insurrection movements. And we are going to start over 2,000 years ago with the origin of the turban wearing phenomenon in the Eastern Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty was established in the year 202 BC and is considered one of the golden ages of Chinese civilization. But by the second half of the second century AD, the dynasty's ruling class had become corrupt and beset by rampant political infighting. This coincided with a series of devastating natural disasters, starting with the flooding of the Yellow River in the year 175 AD, which was followed by many years of prolonged drought. These conditions destroyed harvests, resulting in widespread famine. Yet, the Han Dynasty continued to extract crippling taxes upon an already suffering population. Destitute peasants began to turn to secret Taoist societies for respite from the harsh reality and for guidance in an unstable world. The leader of one such society was a mystic Taoist alchemist known as Zhang Zue, and he quickly amassed a large group of followers. Zhang Zue prophesied to his followers that the current dire circumstances of the empire was proof that the emperor had lost the mandate of heaven, and he claimed that he knew when the Han Dynasty would end. In the traditional Chinese calendar, alongside days, months and years, there is another time unit which groups 60 years together, known as the sexagenary cycle. According to Zhang Zue's prophecy, when the next sexagenary cycle started in the year 184 AD, the sky would radiate yellow and the Han Dynasty would end and a new dynasty would emerge. Zhang Zue rallied a large resistance army and he launched an insurrection against the Han Dynasty in the year 184 AD just as the prophecy foretold. And in the belief that his forces represented the yellow sky that would overturn the Han Emperor, he instructed his troops to wear the yellow turban. Furthermore, because the rebels lacked the funds to have standardized uniforms, the color of the turban worn on their head acted as their main form of identification. At their height, there was a total of 360,000 yellow turbans, and they fought a prolonged civil war against the Eastern Han Dynasty for 21 years, until they were ultimately suppressed in the year 205 AD. Yet, the legend of the yellow turbans lived on, and future insurrections saw themselves as the spiritual successors to the yellow turbans. And just like the yellow turbans, they adopted the turban as a means of group identification and as a symbol of resistance to tyranny. One such group was the White Lotus Society, which emerged in the late 13th century to fight against the Mongol Yuan dynasty. The White Lotus had many similarities to the Yellow Turban Rebellion, namely that it drew support from impoverished peasants suffering from a flood of the Yellow River and high taxation from the central government. 
Unlike the Taoist yellow turbans, the white lotus adhered to Mahayana Buddhism. But the two movements did both view their struggle as one that was ushering in a new era. According to the White Lotus's understanding of Mahayana Buddhism, history had already passed through two eras, and the third era was imminent. This third era would see the arrival of the future Buddha, Maitreya, and the period was to be known as the Bai Lianqi, the White Lotus period. Hence, the secret society named their movement after the White Lotus period, and they adopted the white turban to associate themselves with this mythology. In the 1330s, a Buddhist monk from Jiangxi named Pong Ying Yu launched a large-scale White Lotus rebellion against the UN. But just like the yellow turbans, they failed to overthrow the dynasty. Yet, peace didn't last long, and 20 years later, in the 1350s, another rebel army arose, which was led by the monk and previous White Lotus adherent Guo Zixing. This time, the rebels chose to adopt red for the colour of their turbans, because they believed red was a luckier colour than white. Instead of using religious ideology to underpin their movement, the leaders of the Red Turbans framed their movement as one of Han Chinese nationalism. The goal was to overthrow the Yuan dynasty that was ruled by foreign Mongolians and restore the prestige of the previous Song dynasty that had been ruled by Han Chinese. The original leader, Guo Zixing, died in 1355, but an aspiring commander named Zhu Yuanzhang quickly rose the ranks and assumed the leadership of the Red Turban rebels. Zhu Yuanzhang commanded a series of campaigns against the Yuan armies and in 1368 successfully toppled the Yuan and established the new Ming Dynasty. It seems that red truly was the lucky colour, and after the success of the Red Turban Rebellion, future rebel movements also chose to adopt the Red Turban. Secret societies like the White Lotus continued to operate in China under the radar for the next 500 years. They acted as the meeting places for the destitute and helped to organise peasants on a basis other than a family. They were perpetuated by ritual, where members of the secret societies swore an oath of brotherhood, and this helped to expand the horizons of peasant cooperation beyond the simple household. The secret societies were distributed all over China, and for the most part they had no relation with each other, except for the fact that they all rooted their beliefs in the canons of the three teachings, San Jiao Jing, which combined Buddhism, Taoism and Confucianism. Yet, they were all grouped together by the ruling authorities as White Lotus societies because they had similar traits as the White Lotus those being that they were all underground organisations that consisted primarily of a band of dissatisfied peasants with a set of mystic beliefs. There was one more common feature of these secret societies. When conditions for the average person became too tough to bear, and the government was seen as excessively corrupt and inept, these secret societies organised armed resistance against the government, and adopted the red turban as a sign of their rebellion. The Ming dynasty saw a large-scale red turban wearing white lotus rebellion in Shangdong province in the year 1420 and in the Ting dynasty between the years 1794 and 1804, there was a prolonged campaign by White Lotus rebels in the areas of Sichuan, Hubei and Shanxi provinces. 
alongside wearing red turbans, reports also recorded that these rebels also dyed their facial hair red. Half a century later, in the mid 19th century, the Ting dynasty was in a dire situation. The government was plagued by corruption and inefficiencies and was essentially bankrupt. At the same time, they were under pressure both from Western colonial forces externally and natural disasters internally, such as the flooding of the Yellow River. It was in this context that multiple internal rebellions arose simultaneously. The Nian Rebellion, which fought the Ting forces in Jiangsu, Anhui and Shandong between the years 1851 and 1868, took direct inspiration from the earlier White Lotus rebels. Accordingly, they too wore red turbans. Indicative of the importance of the red turban to the Nian, there was reportedly a red turban wearing youth wing of the rebels whose role was to boost the morale of the regular soldiers. Beginning in 1856, members of the Heaven and Earth Secret Society in Guangdong province also started an armed resistance against Ting authorities. These rebels, who had also adopted the red turbans, even allied with the British forces during the Second Opium War to fight their common enemy, the Ting government. But by far the largest rebellion of the period was the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom that at its height commanded over a vast territory spanning the mid and lower Yangtze River within which lived roughly 30 million people. The Taipings were led by the fanatical Hong Xiaotuan, who sought to overthrow the Ting and revolutionize the Chinese moral and social order, aiming to install his own warped version of Christianity on the Chinese populace. At first, they were known as the long-haired rebels on account of their long, scruffy hair which was in stark contrast to the neat Tue hairstyles that were forced upon the rest of the subservient Chinese populace by the ruling Manchu people. Over time, the Taiping rebels too began to adopt the red turban, partly because they wished to associate themselves with the revolutionary zeal of the other red turban wearing rebellious movements. Looking at photographs of China in the 19th century, it becomes clear that turbans used to be surprisingly commonplace in China. In fact, in this period, it was not just rebels who wore turbans. Government troops and private militias also adopted the turban as part of their uniform. In an age when a lack of government funds meant that military uniforms were rarely standardized, the color of the turban worn on a soldier's head acted as their main form of identification. The most common color in the standard Han Chinese army, known as the Green Standard Army, was a blue turban. Then there were the Yongying battalions, which were forces that were formed of volunteers from a specific region, whose command system was built around the extended family to ensure loyalty. These battalions were known to wear scarlet and dark turbans, and sometimes yellow ones too. When the British battled Chinese imperial forces in the Battle of Taku Forts in 1860, they recorded coming across such yellow turban wearing forces. One of the most effective fighting forces that battled the Taipings was the ever victorious army, which was trained and led by Westerners first by an American mercenary named Frederick Townsend Ward and later by a British army officer named Charles Gordon. The ever victorious army wore Western military attire with the addition of a green turban on their head. The wearing of turbans even stretched to immigrant Chinese communities in California. In the autumn of 1854, two Chinese street gangs 
armed with traditional Chinese weapons and revolvers, fought on the streets of Sacramento. 500 took part in the brawl and there was one fatality. Local reports from the time state that the gang from Hong Kong wore red turbans, whilst those from Canton, current day Guangzhou, wore black turbans. The final large-scale rebel movement that was associated with turbans was the Boxer Rebellion of 1900. Unlike the other rebel movements that we have looked at, whose goals were the overthrow of the Chinese dynasty at the time, the Boxer rebels directed their attacks against the foreign colonial influences inside China, which had been steadily increasing since the signing of the Treaty of Nanjing at the end of the First Opium War in 1842. Some of the boxers wore a red turban, likely in the belief that they could channel the revolutionary spirit of the earlier turban rebellions. Yet, because the boxers fought primarily against the foreigners and not the contemporary Chinese dynasty, much of the symbolism of the turban had been lost, and therefore it was not adopted by all. Since the Han Dynasty, the coloured turban has carried great symbolic and functional value. Through the wearing of the turban, disparate rebellious movements could associate themselves with earlier, large-scale insurrections, and the colour of the turban typically reflected the group's core ideology, giving them legitimacy. At the same time, the accessibility of the simple coloured cloth meant that it was easy for peasants to join the ranks of the rebellion, and also for them to identify with the wider collective. For this reason, the coloured turban has been the core foundation of so many insurrection movements in China over the past 2000 years.